Hi everyone, it's been a while, but welcome to another Coronavirus TV. Uh, 1st of July, um, I think we're now 100 days plus post lockdown in the UK too. Um, so a couple of milestones to, to tick off. Um, another milestone, which is the topic for today, is um, some phase one slash two data for a mRNA vaccine from BioNTech, which is partnered with Pfizer. Um, so the data were published um, not via a press release or you know a tweet or something like that, but actually um, a, a preprint scientific publication not yet made its way into a full journal. But um, the the, uh, the preprint contains a lot of data, which is a criticism that you could perhaps uh, level at other vaccine companies so far. So onto this vaccine, um, the early stage work involved 45 patients across um, three dose ranges and placebo. Um, and basically, um, it was shown that the this mRNA vaccine induces both a really good um, immune response, um, dose dependence, and also this immune response is producing very strong levels of um, uh, neutralizing antibodies against the coronavirus. So it's not it's more important to say that the immune response is targeted and isn't enhancing the virus, but actually deactivating the virus. Um, some really nice features of, of the, the publication. Um, it was very dose dependent. So um, the two lowest doses, uh, you could see very nice responses after the initial dose and then the booster dose, which occurred within a week of each other. Um, the highest dose was just a single vaccination shot. Um, but you can really clearly see the, um, the basically the immune response happening. There was also a nice comparison to the levels of antibodies or neutralizing antibodies that you would expect in, in convalescent sera. So this is, I guess, what the natural biology produces. Um, and it showed that um, there's actually quite a wide range of, of levels of neutralizing antibodies that would be produced naturally. But with this mRNA vaccine, it was actually the levels were very, very predictable and within quite tight bounds. Um, and also towards the higher end of what we see in convalescent plasma. So clearly, you know, a, a very strong immune response likely to be protective um, once we transition this kind of a drug into those phase three trials where you're testing, does it prevent infection, not just does it test, does it create an immune response? Um, one interesting thing that I saw from it, though, um, the vaccine, very good at producing immune response, which is a very strong tick in the box for the efficacy column, does also produce side effects. Um, quite a lot, if not the majority of patients had things such as headaches, chills, fevers, and this necessitated treatment. Um, in a certain sense, I think it's likely that if you're a patient enrolled into the trial, you'd actually be able to know if you received the vaccine or whether you received a placebo, because the incidence of side effects among placebo patients is actually very low, whereas you can almost guarantee that you're going to get a headache or a fever if you're receiving the BioNTech vaccine. So this could complicate larger trials. Um, I mean, these trials rely on many, many numbers, you know, large numbers of people, and also these people mingling and integrating within society, and in particular in communities that are at risk of contracting coronavirus. If you enroll into a trial, you receive an, um, an injection, and you can kind of guess that you've not got the drug, but you've got placebo because you haven't had any reactions. Might it modify your behavior? Um, so it's a slight complication into um, the design of these large studies. I think it's really important that the people that do get in enrolled into phase three are putting themselves at risk. Um, and it perhaps, you know, they can't choose their levels of risk. So you were looking at something like healthcare workers where then, um, you know, they are in the front line regardless. Um, you know, even if they think they've had a placebo, they still need to show up and go to work. Um, the alternative as well as, and it's being discussed, is should this vaccine, which we know produces side effects such as headaches, can you test it actually alongside other vaccines, alongside another vaccine, and alongside placebo? So you might have one vaccine that produces a very strong immune, a very strong kind of headachey response. Some of the other vaccines might be a little bit cleaner, um, but you wouldn't necessarily know whether you'd received vaccine A, vaccine B, vaccine C, or placebo um, if it's a bit more of a... Um, a mixed picture. So this would be an um, umbrella design, much, much more efficient way of running a large vaccine study. Um, but it also relies on um, vaccine kind of timelines all converging. Whereas, at the, you know, at the moment, we're, everyone's still trying to race to get, you know, to get as fast as possible. Um, that's all for today. Another very strong tick in the early evidence supporting vaccines against coronavirus. So I think we can have a bit more confidence in the mRNA technology. 
um, and have confidence that another vaccine candidate is progressing to late stage trials with all of the kind of prerequisite um, ticks in its efficacy box. Uh, so again, you know, a, a reason to be optimistic. Certainly Pfizer's shareholders were very optimistic as they uh, traded its share price up quite a lot. That's all. Um, hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Hopefully there's more optimistic or positive um, topics to come in the future and I look forward to sharing them with you. Thanks a lot and bye.